good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are in the world. Uh, welcome, welcome to a Friday Fireside Chat with uh, my friends Scott Anthony and Paul Cobbin. And we're going to be talking about their soon-to-be-published book, right? It's, it's not out yet. I haven't gotten my copy yet, so otherwise... I just got this a, a few days ago, Rita, so that they're just beginning to ship. Okay, so, yeah. all right. Because normally I wave them around, you know, like I do the Vanna White thing, you know, <laughs> like wave the book around, but I didn't get it yet. But anyway, uh, brand new, it's coming coming any minute. Uh, it's called Eat, Sleep, Innovate. Um, but before we <coughs> get to that, let me just remind everybody this session is being recorded. Do not say or write anything you do not want your mother or the New York Times to see. Um, and, uh, and posterity will remember. Uh, we're also going to take questions in the chat. We don't usually use the raise hand function because we really don't know who's, who's signing in. Um, but if you do have questions, please pop them in the chat. Um, I'll see how many I get to. If we don't get to them during the session today, we will uh, follow up with the chat uh, afterward. So welcome, welcome, Paul Coven and Scott Anthony. Uh, and you've got another couple of co-authors on this very cool new book. But before we get to the book, um, I'd love to just have you say a few words uh, about yourself. Scott, maybe you should start. Great. Well, Rita, thanks Thanks again for having me. It's really great to be honest. I wish we were face to face together and not 8,000 miles apart, but you know, that, that will come before too long. But I, it's great to be with the group here. Just a, a little bit of introduction about myself. I, I'm a senior partner at Innosite, a growth strategy consulting company that many of you will know as being co-founded by the late great Harvard Business School professor Clayton Christensen, who sadly passed away earlier this year at the too young age of 67. I've been part of the Innosite family for 17 years now, since 2003, and have been linked with my colleagues in our quest to empower forward-thinking organizations to navigate disruptive change and own the future. And I'm really, really pleased with the results of this book to help people do just that. That's, that's great. Thanks, Scott. And Paul? Yeah, it's also great to be here. Um, so yeah, so I'm Paul Cobbin and I'm, my official title is the Chief Transformation uh, Officer and the Chief Data Officer of DBS Bank. And DBS Bank is a, uh, the largest bank in Southeast Asia and it's headquartered here in Singapore. Um, and not for the last 11 years, I've worked at DBS and I've had one job and one job only and that's to drive transformation. Um, and the story of the transformation is very much covered in, in the new book. Yeah. Um, so one of the things I think that's that's really interesting about the book is is how it's a very human story, right? And and Paul, I know you've told this story before, but maybe just to get, get our listeners in the right mindset. So you get in a taxi, you're taking this whole new job, right? And you're going to go off to this bank and help it to change, move into the future. And what's the first thing you learn? Yeah, so I asked the taxi driver, "Can you please take me to DBS?" And he looked around at me and says, "Yeah, DBS, damn bloody slow." And, and the reason was is because back in 2009, that's exactly what DBS was famous for. It was a slow bureaucratic company, very poor customer satisfaction ratings. Um, you know, and so that's why I guess I've been hired is to uh, address some of those issues. Mm -hmm. yeah, just uh, building on that for just a second, Rita, I moved out of Singapore in 2010. I remember talking to people about where I should bank. And sorry to say this, Paul, nobody said I should bank at DBS. Nobody. <laughs> <laughs> Which you mentioned in the book, right? That's, yeah, that's a pretty damning indictment, right? So I'm, I'm curious, you walk into a situation like that, you've already got, I mean, it reminds me of very much what an organizational diagnosis professor of mine um, at the Wharton School once said. He said, Rita, it's all there when you walk in the door, you just can't see it yet. <laughs> Which I thought was one of the most profound life lessons, right? So you walk in, how do you decide what, like, what piece of paper to pick up first? What phone call to take? Like, how do you sort of figure out you've got this big mess, where do you start? It's a, it's a great question. And I got kind of lucky because I knew how to do a couple of process improvement type things. And I was, I'd actually um, started off running a pilot of, of five of these process, what we call process improvement events. Um, if you like five day workshops, lean thinking, walk in a process, uh, th trying to take waste out. And I was on the third one. Um, and it was, I think it was November, 2009. And I was facilitating it and I was in full flow and the door of the, the room opened and walked through the door was Piyush Gupta on his first day as the new CEO in the company. You know, what's going on here, he said, and I explained. And I and to cut a long story short, well, actually it wasn't a particularly long story, it's quite a short story. He said, right, this is great. I need you to do 50 of these next year. You know, and so he, from that point, he made it very easy for me to figure out where to go and what to do next. 
interestingly, although, and I'm sure you'll find this interesting, Rita, because he, he was very shrewd at spotting waves of the external waves. Mm-hmm. And he saw the value of being an Asian bank in 2009. This idea, if you think about 2009, we're just coming out of the global financial crisis and the rest of the banking world in, in the West is going off the end of a cliff, you know? And so recognizing that we want to be different. We don't want no longer to emulate those Western players. We want to be our own identity. So we, we put in place a very Asian centric strategy, which, which helped navigate. And part of that was this concept of Asian service. Um, and so we very much focused on, guess what, taking the waiting time out of our customer processes because of the inside of the taxi driver um, on my first day. So yeah. that's where we, we focused on the first couple of years. That's fascinating. So a couple of things to build on that. Um, So one of the metrics you talk about, and I think this is so interesting, is measuring the customer hour. And Scott, I'm sure you had a hand in engineering this, but if I think about most metrics that companies use to drive their strategies forward, most of the time they're either shareholder focused and they're lagging, right? So they're, they're, you know, they're great information about something that's already happened. You can't really change it. but but cust- measuring wasted customer hours, I mean, that is just like, I wish every company on the planet would adopt that metric. <laughs> yes, it was, it was, it was, it was really, um, it's one of those things, you have this idea and it, you didn't realize how powerful it was at the time. And I, I, you know, I said to um, the CEO at the time, I said, you know what, I, I think I can take 10 million customer hours out of the system on a, an annual basis by doing these process in, improvement events, really you know, just reducing the customer wait time. Um, and he said, you better deliver on this. And, but we ended up taking 250 million customer hours out on any basis. And, and if you go back in time, 250 million hours, you end up in the Stone Age. It's a lot of hours. And our customers really noticed the difference. Mm-hmm. Um, in fact, we went from the bottom to the top of the customer satisfaction scores in one year. But the most powerful thing and the reason why when we look, re- reflected back on it is everybody could contribute. Mm-hmm. Everybody, you know, if I, I can contribute an hour, you know, I, I'm, I can get recognized for it. And it was a very empowering and motivating measure. We, we never did a full audit. We didn't kind of check everything, et cetera. It was, it was very much a, this iconic kind of true north that everybody could move towards. And it's well, a pattern it's that we're repeating. I love its simplicity too, because everybody, yeah. you know, as a consumer, you know what a wasted hour sounds like, mm-hmm. um, you know, as a, as a, as a customer. But, but it's so unusual. I mean, it really is. So Scott, one of the things you talk about um, in the opening of the book, which I think is is very interesting, is you know we're so I don't know used to oh Google does it this way and Amazon does it that way and you know you got the same ten companies that get used as examples right left and center, and you talk about no debts as a contrast. Could you perhaps elaborate on that concept? And I think DBS is a great example of one. So a no debt is an acronym for a normal organization doing an extraordinary thing or sometimes doing extraordinary things, plural. And that really is my fascination and and indeed our fascination at Insight because it's great to study the Googles and the Apples and the Amazons and so on. But there's so much about the origin story of those organizations that just makes it really hard to replicate it. When you see something like what you see at DBS, where you see just a, a normal organization, you know, it was back 1968 that it was created. It's a 50 plus year old organization. It's professionally managed. It is regulated. When you see that type of organization moving from being damn bloody slow and lacking in customer satisfaction to being globally recognized as an innovation powerhouse, That says, number one, something interesting is going on. Number two, if DBS can do it, then any organization can do it. This isn't just something that Silicon Valley startups can do. It really is something that every organization is capable of if it thinks and acts in the right way. Yeah, I I really um, think that's very inspiring because one of the things I always wrestle with when I work with senior execs, right, is they say, oh, you know, I I want some of that blockchain stuff from here. And I really want to use the way Google talks about the food, you know, they love the food. And then I want to talk about the way Amazon deals with it. And it's like they pick these, these things that that are, you know, sensible in a coherent whole of the whole organization, but they don't really focus in on, um, you know, how does it work here? <laughs> we are not Amazon, we are not Google, we are not all these other companies. How do, how do we get it to work? And so one of the core ideas that you really talk about is is beans, and that that's sort of a theme throughout the book. Um, and, and I'd love either one of you to talk about how that, you know, what is a bean, how does it look like, and then how do you use it to create this massive culture change? 
So, Paul, maybe I can start with the general overview and you can make it real with one of our mm -hmm. favorites from PBS. That sound good? Yep, That's go good. for it. Okay, so here, here's the basic premise. So the, the idea of Eat, Sleep, Innovate is how do you create a culture of innovation, which we define as one in which the behaviors that drive innovation success come naturally. We make the argument that the biggest enemy you have to fight is institutionalized inertia. Organizations are wired to do what they are currently doing more effectively and more efficiently. They're not wired to do something different, which is what is the core of innovation. So we say, if you're going to break that inertia, you're gonna to have to change people's behaviors. You're gonna to have to change their habits. So we ripped a page right out of the habit change literature and suggest doing that with this thing that we call a BEAN. Now, a BEAN is an acronym, another acronym in the book. There are lots in the book. The BE stands for behavior enabler. That goes after the rational, the logical part of your brain by giving you step-by-step -step guidance, giving you tools, giving you coaches, and so on to help you follow a new behavior. The AN stands for artifacts and nudges. That is an indirect way to encourage new behaviors by going to the unconscious part of your brain where most of the decisions are made. So that might be a picture on the wall that quietly reminds you of something. It might be you getting something that shows a leaderboard and you say, oh, I'm way down here. I wanna do so much better than Paul the next time I do this to quietly encourage you to do new things. And in the book, we've got 101 of them to help people go and overcome the barriers, overcome the inertia and encourage the behaviors that drive innovation success. So that's the general idea. Yeah, so, yeah so, right. so there are hundreds of examples, literally hundreds in the book, which is one of the things I think is most valuable because maybe if one thing doesn't work, okay, but you got like 50 others you could go try. So Paul, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt you. That's quite right. No, and just, um, just to give you an example of how that actually worked at DBS. And, you know, there was one year and we were really thinking about our culture and we get together at the top 250 people in the company once a year for two days. And we run this, what we call at the time, this culture by design workshop, where we, the first step is to articulate this future state culture that you want to be. be. And we, we, our tagline was, we want to be like a startup, this 28,000 person startup. And, and we spend a lot of time defining the characteristics of that. But then we said to the 250, top 250, so, so what's getting in the way? What, what's the blocker, the biggest blocker that's preventing us being like a startup company? And I was very surprised by the answer. I was, I was almost embarrassed because the answer was our meeting culture. And, you know, and you think all the things you could have chosen, but the, we were spending, we were having too many meetings, poorly run, too many people there, overrunning, et cetera. And there wasn't enough time to do all these things that startup companies do. And so we then, using the, the techniques that I described in the book, we designed a ritual that would overcome some of these, these meeting blockers. And the meeting, uh, sorry, the ritual we came up with was called Meeting Mojo. And so every meeting now at DBS um, has a MO, which stands for meeting owner. And the meeting owner has to do three things. They have to state the purpose of the meeting up front. At the end of the meeting, they have to summarize the meeting. And most importantly, which is an idea we did steal from Google directly, is to ensure that they have equal share of voice. There's equal share of voice in, in the meeting. And uh, then the MO also appoints Joe. And Joe stands for joyful observer. And it's a bit of a nod to our vision of making banking joyful. Um, but, the, but Joe simply says at the end of the meeting, spends 30 seconds saying how well Mo did those three things. And when we implemented that, our effectiveness of our meetings doubled as measured by surveys. It was incredible. And, and it was a realization of this, this beam, how powerful it was that you, if you've got a future state, you can actually increment towards, in a, in a programmatic way, you can incrementally uh, progress towards your future state. And we recognize the power of that. Well, it really echoes something Amy Edmondson's talked about for a long time, which is creating very deliberately this notion of psychological safety. So in the book, you talk about one particular meeting where a, a relatively junior person was able to basically, you know, tell a relatively senior person, which is, this is not easy in, in many Asian cultures, uh, that, that, that that just didn't go so well. And how do you make that safe? I mean, I think we all can recognize that's, that's a worthy thing to have happen, but it doesn't happen more often than not. Yes, it, it's, it's, it went far better than I ever imagined. Um, and it's really bizarre. As soon as you are on the spot and everybody's looking at you saying, give me the feedback on the meeting and it's okay to say anything, right? Because that's what we're saying. It's okay to say anything. People are generally very honest and give great feedback. And one of the side benefits of this whole mojo ritual was we gave, people got practice of giving feedback, which they hadn't had before. 
you know, and I've, I've, and by the way, the person was very junior and the person was very senior. And, uh, and that story went right across the company as, as they do. And that gave everybody more confidence to speak mm -hmm. out. So it was kind of a snowballing effect and very, very powerful. Kind of a flywheel um, effect. That's right. So one of our uh, observers, Vince Tobias, who clearly has been up on your story, would like to know, how do you go from damn bloody slow to red? <laughs> Respectful, okay. easy to deal with and dependable. <laughs> okay, so yeah, so as I alluded to, um, Piyush Gupta set in place this Asian strategy in one dimension was, and it, what he asked me to do specifically was go and define Asian service. And I was, you know, new boss, I was trying to impress him. I said, give me a couple of weeks and I'll come back. And he said, no, I want you to take six months. And so we did this enormous amounts of research um, around different cultures and what it meant to have provide Asian service. And I went back and we said, here's 96 different definitions of Asian service. And what he did next was qu quite remarkable when I look back on it. And he said, okay, let's spend two days, top 50 people in the company, we're going to spend two days debating these 96 and we'll whittle it down to something more manageable people can remember. And that's how we ended up with red, which was respectful, easy to deal with and dependable. We debated this. I happened to spell out red, which, which is fortuitous. It's uh, obviously an auspicious color for Asians, et cetera. Um, and and that, that was, yes, absolutely. <laughs> um, absolutely. So, um, and then I said, okay, let's go and put a program of work behind it. And um, again, Pooh said, I don't want just, you know, red on mugs and t-shirts. I want a proper, you know, impactful program. And then we, we um, pivoted these process improvement events uh, to be a lot more customer journey focused. This is very early on before most people even understood uh, what a customer journey really was. And so, you know, typical Pooh asked me to do a hundred customer journeys the following year. Um, and in fact, we asked each of the top 250 to ultimately to sponsor a journey themselves and, and taught them how to do that. And so as a result of doing this very broad uh, approach, we again shifted this, the customer experience um, dramatically. Um, and you know, we, I'm glad to say, not only did we, we get to the top, we stayed at the top pretty much ever since. Of customer if I can schools. make a, a, a general comment about what, what Paul just described there. I, I was really struck when I first heard the story about the top people in the organization doing the customer journeys as well. And it connected into the story of transformation at Intuit, the, uh, the accounting and financial software company founded by Scott Cook, still actively involved in the company. And they too have undergone a, a quite broad transformation as they've infused design thinking throughout the organization. And when we talked to Scott about what allowed it to happen, he had a phrase that I really remember, which is learning by doing by everyone. And they said the hardest behavior to change in many cases is the most senior people in the organization, just because they've been there the longest, they're the most ingrained in traditional, research, in traditional ways of working. So in their case, it was, we want to go and do similar sorts of customer observations. We want to do rapid prototyping and so on. And it wasn't just, we're going to have a department do it. We're going to ask the top people in the organization to truly walk the talk and experience what the new behavior is. So the idea of learning by doing by everyone, I think is a really important concept about how you have culture change that sticks and scales. So Scott, let's pick up on that because I think this is something that I see as a, a way, a, a barrier that frequently happens, which is, you know, the senior guys sort of say, yes, yes. I mean, men and women say, yes, 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 this uh, absolutely. But, you know, I'm really busy. Um, I've got all these demands on me. I've got shareholders breathing down my neck. I've got this, 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 this operational thing, this crap, but blah, blah, blah. You, know, you all know the, what it sounds like. Um, and that's really code word for I'm much too busy and much too important to spend my time on these things. And how do you combat that? Well, it's a great, great question. And I think sometimes you have to recognize that if that is truly what the senior leaders believe, if that is truly what they believe, the odds of having scale culture change is pretty low. As I mean, if, if they really believe that they can't do it because the shareholders are, because they don't have the time to, then it's not going to work. So, you know, at the first hand, you have to say, okay, let, let's be realistic about the degree to which you really want to do this. Because if you're going to ask for it, but you're not going to personally commit to it, you're making a clear decision. You know, where you spend your time as always is a reflection of your priorities. But if you get beyond that, you begin to say, well, are there high leverage ways that senior leaders can begin to do some of these things? That might be 
having an external membership in a council. I was talking to the CEO of an organization in Australia, and she said the way that she goes to experience different things is she's part of a sustainability group in Australia, and there's tons of vibrant people there, and it's a super fast way to get exposed to lots of different ideas. And just about every CEO has some kind of outside thing that they do, so you can use that spot on your calendar to do something. The second thing I've heard some leaders do is they have a go-to question, just a question they repeatedly ask that's a really good discovery-oriented possibility opening up question. Like there's a, a CEO of a, a large industrial company in the United States where the question that he likes to ask is, tell me where this will take us. So he's trying to get people to look beyond the specific thing they're talking about to go somewhere that's a little bit further ahead. And then, of course, the third thing that a leader can do is they can set up a structure. You know, they can set up something like the function that, that Paul ran or the innovation group within DBS that essentially allows the energy to go through the organization without them individually spending the time. So there are high leverage things that CEOs can do. But at the same time, I think if the CEO is trying to or whomever is the responsible executive in the organization, if they're trying to get out of doing it, that means it's really not that important to them. And they really should just stop talking about it. Yeah, you're almost better off not starting, in my experience. Like the worst thing of all is you start these things, you get everybody all excited, people are engaged, you have, in, well, I do a lot of work on the innovation space, we have innovation boot camps, you know, and post-it notes are all over the walls and it's great, right? And then you get to, oh, that was really fun, but you know, I got the quarterly then I'll see it, you know. And it just, it just, it, it's like worse than if you ever start, never started. So one of the questions that's come in is um, the metric of wasted customer time, two beans, two mojo, like how does that gestalt fit together? So actually, um, as it's only really by looking back at what we did, we realized that we, we're actually introducing okay. beans. You know? Okay. <laughs> um, and you know, actually through that. Moment, what, what yeah. you're, that, that's I think, something really important for our listeners, which is, you know, when, when those of us who write books and think about things sort of put it all together in a, in a beautiful story at the end, it sounds so it's smooth and planned and it's wonderful at the actual moment it's a bloody mess right you're sort of well that didn't go very well and then oh well that went better than expected and i just learned this the other thing you know it's it's not been distilled yet and so i think just as an encouragement just because something didn't go the way you thought it was just don't give up hope <laughs> I, absolutely i couldn't agree with you more and and it's actually in that that pie era is only by looking back and and what I was in amongst it, I realized that we were really unlocking the energy of the organization. And I, and I was baffled. Why is everybody getting so excited about what we're doing? And, and it's only by unpacking it that we realized that the customer hour was hugely impactful as an iconic measure. It wasn't, it wasn't threatening. If we'd have gone after productivity, that would have been threatening, right? It, wasn't, it was this wanting to go for the higher order purpose. One of the other things that we did uh, during that PIE era was, was also very impactful that my predecessor had been doing something very similar, but he couldn't get any changes through. And having been told about this, we just changed the process. So on the Wednesday morning of the five-day uh, workshop, we would invite all the, the seniors or the stakeholders who own part of the process. And the, the team that had been working on it frantically for the last two days would say, if we make these changes right now, we can have this future state that's better. Is it okay if we do it? And it's just much harder to say no to a room full of people when you see them eye to eye than, than just ignore the email. You know? And 99% of the time, we got a yes. Mm. And when we got a no, we said, can we run an experiment? You know? And so each one of these was a bean. But we never, of course, they didn't call it a bean at the time. Um, it's only in hindsight. Mm -hmm. I will say just a, again, a general point. I, I think one of the things the DBS tripped across that is brilliant is this idea of finding ways to at least come up with proxies for things that appear to be difficult to measure. And I think Rita, you nailed it when you said, you look at something like you know, shareholder value or you look at revenues or current stock price, that is a lagging indicator. That's a result of things that happened months, quarters, and years ago. And something like how many customer hours are we wasting or what is our net promoter score or what is our employee engagement? Those are great leading indicators because those indicate what will happen in the future. And I think the more that we are able to come up with the depersonalized metrics that are leading indicators that require no doubt some creativity, some work, some proxies to go and do, I think we can help everybody make some of these changes happen. And I think DBS did a great job of this. Again, not intentionally in the beginning, but you know, let, let's study from the kind of quasi-accidental or celebrate during the quasi-accidental successes. Right, and one of the, the companies you mentioned in the book is Microsoft, 
And, and one of the things that I've been very vocal about praising Satya Nadella for doing is changing a company who's focused for the better part of a decade. And they delivered excellent, excellent performance in lagging indicator terms, right? Terrific profits, terrific margins. I mean, you know, you couldn't have asked for better from a strict sort of bean counting shareholder value point of view. And yet people were saying, this company's fading into irrelevance. The PC era has come to an end. I mean, you know, the sort of leading indicators look very bleak, even though the lagging indicators looked great. And one of the things Nadella did was he refocused all the metrics on, you know, what do we need to be thinking about if we're looking at the future of our customer experience, which he uh, documented in his book, um, Hit Reset, uh, which I think is another great story for our our listeners of, of corporate, sort of corporate transformation. So how did you guys connect? How did you get involved? with with Innosite and and how did that sort of fit together in this larger transformation? Well, I think if you remember, Scott, I think the first time we really interacted was when we invited you to speak at one of these leadership conferences I was telling you about, which was uh, held in Phuket. Um, I remember it it distinctly because I was on stage interviewing Scott and Scott just got my name wrong the whole interview, if you remember, Scott. <laughs> I remember it. I, it's hard not to remember that. It was very embarrassing. But yes, I, Neil, Neil, Neil. Yes, I kept calling you Neil. And if you know who Neil was at DBS, you know that Paul and Neil are very different characters. It, it oh, not no. one you would mix up. But yeah, <laughs> they both happen to be Caucasian, but they're, they're just very different personalities. They all look the same, Scott, you know. <laughs> <laughs> but no, yeah, so, so after but, but that, uh, go, go ahead, ahead, Paul. No, no, you right, so on the back of that, um, we got to know each other and we, we had this mutual curiosity about this topic, this question about whether you can actually develop a culture by design, you can programmatically change a culture. And it just so happened that I was setting up a um, software development uh, house for a DBS in, in Hyderabad at the time and I was overseeing it. You know, we really started it from zero up to a thousand people. And, then, and I was very um, interested in see if I can create a culture as we grew um, that was unique and, and a little bit different from the mothership. Mm. Um, unfortunately, I was, I was wrong. I got this completely wrong. The influence of the mothership was very great. And we were hitting some engagement issues, which is when uh, Scott and I started to work together and we brought in the InnoSight team to work through that challenge. And that's where we, we tested some of these ideas um, that you'll find in the book. Um, and I'm glad to say, obviously, it, the, the story has a very happy ending. And that as a result of this piece of work that we did, we um, introduced these new rituals, these beans to overcome some of the blockers that we uncovered and the engagement of the, uh, the, that um, software development shop became uh, uh, equitable the rest of the company, which is very high. Uh, and equitable? Which oh. was very high with, rest, with the rest of the rest of DBS. So okay. it was lagging behind previously. Oh, I see. Um, and yeah, and we, through this work, we were able to get the, the engagement right back up to where we were happy. That's fascinating. I mean, you know, a lot of times, um, you know, consultants kind of get a bad rap, right? That, that you're brought into either justified decisions management wants to make already, or, you know, you borrow the guy's watch to tell him the time, that kind of thing. And yet I think there are places where an external perspective can be, you know, super useful. And, and Scott, you know, I've worked together on a number of engagements where, you know, just coming in with a different mindset can really be one of those points of leverage. Um, so I wonder if you could just elaborate on that a little. So when, what's a good way to use an outside firm like that? What's what's a not so good way to do it? Yeah, it's a great question. And, you know, certainly we have been, you know, I've been in consulting for about 20 years now between Innocide and the couple of years I spent at McKinsey before that. So I, I, I have had both great engagements, like the one we did with Paul and engagement set where you're happy when it ends, right? And I think a lot of the contrast is really three things. One is the question that is asked at the beginning. And the thing that was so great about the question Paul asked is there was no obvious answer to it. It wasn't a question where there was an article that you could go and apply. It was a discovery of new methods. So it really was a co-creative activity where you needed to get additional brains who would think about the problem in a different sort of way. So one thing is really asking the right question. The second thing to get good use out of consultants is really to make sure that you're making the investment on the client side to make sure you're receiving the consultant's work. The worst thing from our perspective is when we get handed a question and the client runs away. I mean, people always worry, you know, the senior consultants are going to show for the pitch meeting, show for the final meeting and then disappear. But really the bigger risk is the client disappears. And then if the client disappears, they see the final result and they say, oh yeah, that's really interesting work. And the document goes up onto a shelf. And that's not why 
most of us at least are in the business. We're not here to produce documents that go on the shelf. We, we want to change organizations in a material, in a meaningful sort of way. So that's the second thing, client involvement. And the third thing, and I remember this very distinctly from the work that we did with Procter & Gamble now more than a decade ago, is try to think as you're working with a consultant, not just how they're going to solve the, or give you a particular answer, but try to really work side by side with them so you can learn how they're solving the problem so you don't have dependency that comes in. Ultimately, you learn how to do things yourselves. And P&G, I think, was best in class at this, at really trying to understand what was underneath the hood so they could ultimately internalize it and use it something that would, something that would be an internal capability. So th those are some of the things that I've seen that separate the good from the bad. I mean, you have these moments that just drive you crazy. I remember we were working for a company in China. It was an American company with their Chinese arm. And we're working through diligently this question they'd asked us about their business model and all that. And we're producing our final report and the client says, okay, great, thank you. Let me compare that to the BCG, to the Bain, to the KPMG, to the McKinsey answer, to the same question that's been asked over the past five years. And the response back is, I don't really care what you do. Just do something. Do something from one of these reports because this is just a waste of your time, money, and energy. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't, again, bring any joy to the people who are doing the work. Yeah. And, you know, if you just wanted to publish things that sat on a shelf, you could just stay in academia. We're really good at that. <laughs> you know, that doesn't have to lead to action at all. That's not the criterion that we're often measured on. Um, great. So let's come back to, uh, you talk about the behaviors. And I think one of the things I really love about this book is the focus on behaviors. So it's not, a lot of books on innovation focus a lot on the idea of innovation or the, you know, some tool or you know something but you guys really talk about human behaviors and you specifically call out five so uh, curiosity customer obsession collaboration the ability to cope with ambiguity and empowerment um and i recently was talking to uh, aaron mayer from INSEAD who's studied netflix culture and the parallels between you know the netflix sort of understanding of what creates innovation what you've outlined here are very very stark you know they're very much honing in on the same behaviors. So have we actually decoded something about what it takes to be innovative on an ongoing basis? I mean, in my work on innovation, you know, there's, there's a couple of different flavors, right? So there's the sort of great person theory of innovation where you've got one person who drives it and it makes it happen and it all works. And then that person leaves and the whole thing falls, falls apart. Uh, and yet what you seem to be working on is now a really embedded cultural ongoing, not dependent on one person, not dependent on one crisis sort of process for making innovation routine almost. Yeah, so I, you know, I'm a very big, strong believer of the, the latter model. Um, I've never worked in an environment, I'm sure it exists, but I've never seen an environment where that's worked, certainly in the financial industry. It's really rare. So we get a lot of people come to visit us um, and say, how did you do this transformation? And, you know, the first thing I say to them is, so where, what are you transforming to? And you would be amazed how, how few leaders can actually articulate this, what I call this vivid picture of the, the future. Um, but then the next qu set of questions they ask is, tell me about the technology you're using. And it's a wrong question. You know, we didn't do that by, you know, technology does not change itself. Only the people can change the technology. So it's, it, the problem is about the people. You know, companies can only change what they do if, if what, the people that are in them change their behaviors. That's it. Right? And so, the, so you have to believe that. The second thing that you have to believe that if you create the right climate for these people, for your people, they will do amazing things. And it, you know, it comes back to Amy Eppinson's work on psychological safety. If you create the right environment and it's got to be no fear there at all, then you will just, uh, they will just work magic. And that's what we had seen. And we stumbled on it, um, as I mentioned earlier. And the third thing you've got to believe, as you know, we've talked about already, which is you can actually create this climate programmatically. And, you know, so, so I'm a big believer that, you know, it's about and what, it's what differentiates the DBS transformation from, from a lot of the others that we see is this belief that we brought any, everybody along. We have fired not a single person because they didn't get on the journey. If somebody says to me, a leader comes to me and says, you know, I had to fire a whole bunch of people that weren't getting on board. I say to them, well, that I see that as a leadership failure. You did not create the right environment. The vast majority of people will want to get on board if you make the environment correct. You know, and so I think that's kind of what we got right at DBS to a certain extent. Mm -hmm. That's harder yeah. to pull off than it looks. I mean, it's really easy to kind of say, you, you resistors, you're out, out you know, you, you're gone. Mm. But to actually bring them along, that, that's hard. Scott, you want to... Well, it, 
go ahead. No, go ahead, Paul. Uh, I actually I have a, a question for you after this, though, that ties into what Rita just said, if you don't mind. If I can break in and ask a question, Rita, if that's okay. Yes, yeah, yeah. Oh, well, hey, I'll hand over the controls to you. You drive for a while. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I was going to say it's not hard if you're patient. I think it's patience that you need uh, and tenacity uh, and to, to go for the long term. We've been doing this for 11 years now. Um, so, you know, and, you know, it, it, that's what it takes to a certain extent. Uh, and Paul, that ties exactly into the question I was going to ask, you know, so Piyush came in as CEO in 2009, and he's still CEO in 2020. So that's 11 years for CEO. That's above average tenure. Of course, uh, those of you who know the way Singapore is structured, one of the largest shareholders in DBS is Tomasic, which is a sovereign wealth fund with a very long term horizon. Do you think that that's been critical to the success that you've had? Yeah, I, I, unfortunately, I have to say that it's an important ingredient. I'd love to tell you that I could do this in any company and whatever, but that stability of leadership, strategy, and approach, massively important. Um, and and I, I don't know whether it's essential, um, but it certainly makes it uh, a lot less difficult than it would have been. Yeah. Well, you know, one of the interesting new developments just this year is um, Eric Reese, you know, who you obviously know, um, a lean startup fame would be how most people know Eric. Um, but, you know, he's just, he spent the last decade of his life creating this thing called the long-term stock exchange. And you have to qualify to be listed on that exchange. And you have to go through a fairly rigorous process of saying, you know, we're not about short-term returns for people that trade our stock by the second, you know, we're, we're about building long-term lasting value for multiple stakeholders. And, you know, I think that's one more piece of evidence that we're starting to get really, I think, fed up with this um, extractive, you know, shareholders who hold a firm for half a day deserve more say than people that give their entire lives to a company kind of mindset. And I think I'm very hopeful that that is something of a turning point. And we're starting to see examples like this, which show people what's possible when you do take a slightly longer term. And in the, at the end of the day, it pays off more fully for everyone, all the stakeholders. Yeah, I was talking to uh, Colin Mayer out of Oxford University, and he's written about purposeful organizations and he's challenging the role of, of directors not just to look after the kind of financial return for shareholders but to honor a predefined purpose of the company you know and it's the same thing it's about having this longer term vision and it's definitely part of the dbs story is that we have been allowed to have a slightly longer term focus than maybe some of our other banking friends mm -hmm. well of course finance is really at the at the peak of what i would argue is is the financialization, certainly in the American economy, you see this very strongly. I mean, you, you could spend your entire day parking in a parking garage, living in a home, having a, a protective force, eating food. You could, you could spend your entire day consuming things created by companies owned by hedge funds or private equity firms. <laughs> you know, I mean, you, we've taken financialization to an extreme and, and that, that's, that's a whole other conversation. But I do think it's, it's, it's a fascinating um, dilemma that, that, you know, and I think your story really illustrates there is an alternative way. There are, there are fruitful alternatives we can look at. So you talk a bit in the book about becoming invisible, that the best thing you can do as a bank is, is to be kind of be frictionless, be invisible, not be part of your uh, consumers' lives. And why I think that's so interesting is something I often get in trouble for saying to my clients is, uh, you know, nobody gets up in the morning deliriously thrilled because they're going to sign the contract or the purchase order or the whatever it is to do business with your firm. Like, nobody. <laughs> I mean, I don't care whether it's signing your tuition check or signing up for your bank account or buying a dress or whatever it is. Nobody wants to do those things because they're intrinsically wonderful. They're doing them because they have, as, as Clayton Christensen would have said, a job to be done in their lives. And in many ways, those of us who are more successful than others make getting that job done the most direct, frictionless immediate experience. Absolutely. I mean, we were very heavily influenced by Clayton's work around jobs to be done thinking, and it's very much part of our customer journey design and the whole functional, social and emotional job to be done was something that we really focused on. In fact, you know, I would argue the differentiating factor for our customer journeys was really spending time at the beginning of the process. And we have a, what we, call, we have a, what we call a 4D process and the first D is discover. And one of the techniques was teaching these 250, top 250, just spend time understanding the problem, really understanding what the customer's trying to get done. And you're right, it ain't to open a bank account or it's not to apply for a mortgage. There's a broad, maybe I want a home, you know, and or something, and, and just think about that. Um, and so, but the interesting thing is it's really hard 
the customers won't tell you. They don't tell you exactly what they're trying to do. Well, and therefore, don't... you have to spend. They don't. Well, I know exactly. They don't, they don't know. know so, they know sort of intrinsically. When they see it, they know it. That's right. So you have to spend time, you know, and, and doing the, the hard-earned research around that. And uh, so we've, we've had some really interesting insights uh, around, around that, um, which has been clearly differentiating. Mm-hmm. Um, so it's Scott, a really hard. I mean, it's a really hard thing. I mean, I think about us. It's the same thing. I mean, nobody wakes up and says, "I would love to buy a consulting project." Right? <laughs> I mean, that, that, that's not the job to be done. I mean, that's the last thing that most people want to do. But uh, of course, there, there are other things that they want to do. They want to improve the performance of their organization. They want employees to be more engaged. They want what, whatever it is. But if you think that you're selling consulting projects, I mean, this is back to Theodore Levitt and marketing biopia, where you, you think your SIC code or whatever is equivalent defines the problem that you're solving for customers, and it just doesn't. You just have to be able to plant yourself in their shoes and say, what is the fundamental job to be done or else you're going to make mistakes mm-hmm. in every industry. So, I, I mean, some of our listeners may not be familiar with that concept. So maybe Scott, if you wouldn't mind just taking a minute and sort of explain what that means and maybe offer an example. Yeah. I mean, the, the, the basic idea, you know, so this is, we, we've been talking about Clayton Christensen's idea of the job to be done. And you know, the basic idea is people don't buy products and services. They hire them to get jobs done in their lives. So it's not that people go and buy a product. It's essentially they hire a solution. They hire something that addresses a pain point, solves a need, gets a job done, however you want to describe it. And this is not a new concept. Peter Drucker famously said that the customer rarely buys what the company thinks it is selling. The, you think that you're providing a service, but what the customer really wants is satisfaction. Of course, course, Clayton would tell the, the very famous story of the milkshake, which I'm sure many of you have heard, where a fast food company went to study the milkshake market and found out that people weren't really buying a milkshake. In the morning, they were hiring a companion for a long, boring commute. In the afternoon, they were hiring a tool to create an emotional connection between a, young, a mother and a young child. Those are two very different jobs to be done, and the criteria that people measure the product against are completely different. A a commuting companion needs to be thick. Something that appeases a child in the afternoon has to be small and thin, so it can be consumed quickly, and on and on and on. But the fundamental question to always ask is, what is the job to be done? It is a simple question, but one that can really reorient you and change the way that you think about markets. And of course, there's books and books on this. The the last one from our shop is Competing Against Luck by Clayton Christensen, my colleague David Duncan, and a couple other authors. David Duncan is working on a follow-up to that book that will hopefully be out next year. So a lot to be said about the topic. Well, and um, just in light of the current crisis on our university campuses, um, I had uh, uh, Paul LeBlanc um, as, as a guest a, a few months ago, actually now, and he was talking about, you know, the two fundamentally different jobs that, that, that we deal with in higher education. One is the coming of age experience or the experience of networking and being on campus and, you know, the bonding and all that. And the other is, you know, getting the credential, getting the degree, getting the the, the completion, and that you have to design completely different systems for those two different jobs. And I've been very intrigued watching, um, and perhaps Singapore has solved this, but here in the U.S., you know, our college situation is a hot mess. I mean, the range of care and response ranges from people that have completely resolved it and it's absolutely fine all the way through to maybe we'll open, maybe we won't, maybe we'll open, maybe, maybe it's just, you know, it's just like, it's mind boggling. Uh, but I think what it has revealed is how important that coming of age experience is to the economic value proposition of a university education, that it's not, you know, whatever, <laughs> those of us in academia, whatever we talk about in the classroom is like, you know, it's got value. <laughs> <laughs> when it comes to, am I going to pay $70,000? N- 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 not that much value. <laughs> you know, it's so very, very interesting. Um, so one of the kind of another sort of counterintuitive concept in the book is I want an innovation group that doesn't do any innovation itself. And, and that to me kind of flies in the face of mountains of literature on skunk works and incubators and accelerators. And you have to give it to the people who have this talent because the rest of the organization doesn't know how to do this. That just seems really counterintuitive to an awful lot of advice that I see in the world of the innovation literature. Yeah, so it came about really on the back of the success of our customer experience work, um, the PIEs, there was a, there was a parallel stream which you should describe as Asian innovation and to be honest we'd had a couple of full starts we we had tried that we had tried the you know hiring very bright people with great ideas um but they could not sell them into the company you know they they just wasn't you just kind of the non-invented here whatever it was 
And because we'd had this success and we'd unlocked the energy around customer experience, there was this hypothesis, can we do the same for innovation? So, you know, we, we hired Neil Cross, who you just heard about uh, earlier as the chief innovation officer, and said, you build a small team, um, and you gave him and the team pretty well free reign, but said this, this is the only rule. Under no circumstances are you to innovate. And the reason is, you know, that you teach the rest of the company how to do it. You know, it goes back to the earlier point about lowering the barriers to, to these things. You know, innovation is a scary topic for a lot of people. They think it's, you know, for all the very creative types. And I'm a banker. I can't possibly be creative. It's against my inner value system. But, you know, innovation is a teachable thing. And, you know, through these programs that they put in place, you know, this is when we realize we can indeed move the whole company. Mm. I mean, that's, that's really inspiring and a little counterintuitive, you know, that your commitment as a leader of innovation is not to sort of create the shiny object yourself. I mean, you know, that's, that's hard to resist. I mean, that has a certain draw in it. I mean, I, Scott, you and I've worked with leaders who, you know, they're, they're, let's say they're 50-ish, you know, and all of a sudden they've got the leeway to come to work in jeans and they've got white sneakers on and they're, you know, maybe they grow a beard and, and you know, and they're like Mr. Innovation. Um, and one of the uh, leaders I'm going to have um, later on in the season in the, in the, as a fireside chat is Gisbert Rule, who is one of my idols. He really did a whole digital transformation at uh, Klockner, which is a German metals manufacturer. And one of the things he said that I thought was just fascinating in terms of why would he draw attention to this? He said, you know, my job in part was to bring together the new shiny object digital people, but the secret sauce for what's going to keep us competitive is the deep, deep technical expertise we have in places like Duisburg, you know, where the headquarters is. And he said, for the first four years, I made sure to wear my suit and tie to work. <laughs> and why I thought that was so fascinating was, you know, it was a symbol of that commitment. Like, no, I'm not coming to work, you know, in, black turtlenecks and pretend I'm Steve Jobs, you know, <laughs> I'm going to do exactly what I do as a leader of the company. But our, our commitment is to empower you to have a contribution to this process, which I thought was absolutely uh, fascinating. So what are some of the big lessons learned? And we've had a couple of comments in the chat about what was messy, what would you do differently? What were some of the things if somebody was going to embark on this journey here, uh, coming out of COVID, whatever we're doing next, <laughs> what, are there uh, any sort of big headlines you'd offer them? Yeah, I've made many, many mistakes uh, that I would hopefully not repeat. One of the th things I hadn't appreciated up front enough, and you alluded it to uh, earlier about how leaderships don't necessarily get on board, et cetera. Uh, it's kind of linked to that, which is early on when we're doing these programs, whether it's customer experience, innovation, uh, and, and other ones, we position them as things you need to do on top of your job. And as a result, you know, there was always an excuse about having got enough time, et cetera. And more latterly, we've learned from that and say we position it, sorry, this is just a new way of doing it around here. And that just makes it a, a it's not a kind of an add-on thing. It's not an either or. You're just going to do it in a new way. And that just makes it a whole lot easier. And more importantly, it's sustaining. You know, and, and you actually make the change more permanent. Some of the early PIEs we ran, you know, we had to go and redo them. Um, because they just reverted back or, or the process had deteriorated. So that's probably one of the, um, the changes that I would have made. I'd also also started with the customer, you know, the customer journeys first, and really that was when the whole leadership got behind it. And they understood before when we were doing process, it was, it was only part of the company that was involved. But as soon as you've got the customer kind of at the center of it, then everybody said, right, I get this now and I want to participate. I guess just one, 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 I'd offer one reflection on the DBS story. And then one thing that, that we've learned at Intersight as we've been applying some of the concepts in the book over the course of the past year, as Rita will know well, a book that launches in October was written, was written well before October. So there, there's a reasonable gap between the writing and the actual physical production of the book. But yeah, I, I think one of the things that it really is a key part of the DBS story is the storytelling. It, it is, you've heard a lot of it here. You've heard about Red. You've heard about a 28,000 person start up. There was a moment where DBS would talk about being a Gandalf company, Google, Amazon, that. Netflix. I'm going to lose that. DBS, Apple. I, I got the acronym wrong, didn't I? LinkedIn and Facebook. I put the D in the wrong spot, but you, you get the point. You put a D in between the, these great titans of tech and you say that is our comparison set. 
And there's just a lot of really good storytelling like that, which I think is really important because it, it captures the heart of the people who are doing the hard work as well. And DBS is one of the best that I've seen at doing it. So I don't think that's a new insight. I think that's something you'll see if you look at culture change literature, but I think a reinforcement of how important that is. And then the thing that we've learned just being in the trenches working on this is how important it is to be as specific as possible about the desires, that, about the behaviors that you're seeking and about the things that you are doing instead of those behaviors, the behavioral blockers that are getting in the way of you doing what you want. It is very easy to be superficial. There was a great article in Slow Management Review, Don Sol was the lead author, that looked at the relationship between a company's stated values and what it actually did. And deep research looking at semantic analysis of Glassdoor and so on said that the correlation coefficient between those two is zero is zero. So there's no tie between values and behaviors because people don't do the hard work to say, if integrity is one of our values, this is what that actually means. This is what you will do on a day-by-day do -day basis. And then when things are going wrong, saying this is what we are doing instead. Because once you know the specific behavior, once you know the specific thing you're doing instead, the intervention is easy. If you don't know that, you're going to have something that might work or might not. Mm -hmm. I think that's that's such a key point, and the 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 importance of stories. Um, we you know work on. I guess the older I get, the more convinced I am that the story trumps just about everything. And in the book, I mean, we focused on DBS, Paul, because you were kind enough to share the hour with us. But you've got a lot of other examples. And one of the things I think that's remarkable for a book on innovation is it's not all just private sector firms. You know, God smote the earth, and you know. Apple emerged. Um, you know, you talk a lot about uh, organizations that are trying to do environmental things, organizations that are trying to improve the human experience in many ways, disaster preparedness or disaster recovery. Um, and so this isn't just something that is driven by the profit motive, right? This is something that, you know, you could, I mean, the book could be applied to many other kinds of human endeavor. Yeah, absolutely. One of my favorite stories, and I, and I love all the stories. I love all my children. I love all my books. I love all my stories. But, you know, one of my favorite stories in the book is the story of the Settlement Music School, which is a very different organization than DBS. So it's a more than 100-year-old not-for-profit in the Philadelphia area. A new CEO, Helen Eden, took over about 10 years ago and started a pretty bold transformation of the organization. It's a different story. The key part of Settlement Music School is it teaches music classes through six physical branches. And I, I just remember distinctly talking to Helen in April of this year. I mean, you would think that she'd be despondent because, you know, having six physical physical branches in a world that is locking down and we have no idea how long things are going to go feels like a bad thing. But Helen had made the investment more than a decade ago to build a culture of innovation where they're always trying to understand the end market needs, always willing to try new things and so on. And a week after lockdown, 170 teachers are giving virtual lessons. Because the innovation culture was in place, it was easy for Helen and team to respond. And Helen is a great growth mindset leader. She said, you know, that the pandemic obviously is a bad thing, but we have a chance here to do something. And by doing something, that's what gets us motivated. That's what lifts our spirits. So that is our obligation to go and drive this. So this is a reasonably small not-for-profit that teaches music that has embraced some of the very same ideas in the book. So you can be a 28,000 person organization like Paul, or you could be a much smaller organizations like Helen and the stuff works. And, and it, it's relevant for everybody. You know, I think a lot of times when people think about business books, it's sort of, uh, all right, you know, um, buzzword bingo, um, here we go. Uh, <laughs> but this book isn't like that at all. You know, I found it very accessible, very readable. You know, you can see yourself in many of the examples. Um, Lots of diversity in the protagonists and the people that you talk about and very global kind of examples, which, which I thought was, was very interesting. A um, couple of the things you talk about, and I know we're, we've got just a couple minutes left. So in a minute, I'm gonna ask you how people can learn more, but uh, one video that gets very popularly sort of circulated when you talk about these kinds of changes um, is, and it makes it clear that we focus on the leader. You know, We focus on the person that takes the initiative, but actually the person who's the fast follower or who's the next person to sign up is often the most important and use the analogy of the move, the dancing man. You know? So that's a really risky move, right? So you've got somebody who's making a change and you've got the great majority that are kind of hanging out on their beach blankets or whatever they're doing. And you have to decide if you're going to get up and follow this person, if you're going to get up and dance, you know, and how do you, how do you cross that level of fear? How do you get people willing to take that next step, the follower step? 
Yeah, it's a, it's a great question. And, and I think that the kind of meta answer is the more the environment, and we're going to keep paying homage to Amy Edmondson as we go through the discussion, the more the environment is psychologically safe, the easier it is. Because if you follow, this is the Derek Sivers TED Talk, if you follow the lone nut, and it turns out the person's actually crazy and it's not going to work and you were wrong, no big deal. You know, no harm, no foul. So that, that's the number one thing, psychological safety. The number two thing, and I think this goes to a lot of the things that Paul talked about, about being successful at DBS, following the lone nut is a few steps. It's not that you have to go and get in a car and drive down and then get in an airplane too. It's a pretty easy thing to go and do. And again, you take a few steps, you start dancing, turns out it's wrong, you slowly back away. So the experiment that you have to run is a reasonably small experiment. The more that's the case, obviously the easier it is to do. So if you're the person who's kind of on the show, should I do it, should I not do it, you can't make up your mind, what is a small way? What is a way that you can at least take that step forward and decide is it worth taking the second and the third and the fourth and so on? Mm -hmm. Yeah, a friend so, of mine just has, to add, just, you know, the, the, if you've got a big ask you want to make of people, you don't go right there. You start with a little ask. Sorry, Paul, go ahead. Yeah, so, so just and what we describe at DBS is we, all our transformations have been T-shaped. And it's exactly as Scott described. We have a very broad part of the T. The barrier to entry is very low. We teach you the bare minimum to get going. We do not put a gun to your head to say, show me the results. You get rewarded for participation. But then there's a deep part of the T where we do care. It's the five or six projects that we really want to make a difference. It gets management attention. It gets a focus. It gets investment. And we've repeated that pattern at least 10 times. And this just really worked for us. And it's, again, it's just removing the fear of participation. Mm -hmm. That, that's very inspiring. And, and also inclusion, right? I mean, and I don't, I don't mean inclusion in the sort of politically correct check the box sense. I mean, you know, people feel they can be involved and that their, their, their input is welcomed, which is really the core of inclusion, I think. Um, and you guys have demonstrated how valuable that can be when you really do have this broad base of all of your people in getting involved. Okay, so we're nearly, oh wow, that went fast, out of time. Um, how do people learn more, obviously, get the book, that would be the obvious thing, uh, but other, other ways they can sort of be part of your world. How, do, how does that happen? Well, so we've got a companion website to the book, eatsleepinnovate.com, and we're trying to put as much stuff as our publisher will let us, which they're letting us put a lot, on the website, including how you access some of the beans that we talk about, some of the tools, and so on. And of course, this all then connects into InnoSight, where there's information on all the other things that we do. And of course, then you go to the individuals. I'm on LinkedIn, Twitter, et cetera, mostly LinkedIn. That's where I spend most of my time on, on social media. And we are trying to do some different things with this book. So we are going to launch in early November in conjunction with the publisher, uh, a kit that can be purchased by people who want to actually go and use the tools in the book for their team group or department. I mean, obviously you can just read the book and do it, but this is something that says, here's the way you structure a meeting and here's the specific agenda and here's the email that you send and here's the capture templates and all and all and all. We, of course, I mean, I got to be honest, we hope some people want to buy our consulting services, but we recognize that there are lots of people who can't afford it. So this is meant to be a simpler, more affordable, more convenient solution. Maybe so a little your kit will be available in time for the holidays, right? It will. It will. Okay, yeah, beginning so of November is what it's supposed you have to a friend, You know, not for profit leader, person you can't buy presents for, person who's struggling with their own business. Christmas idea, right? <laughs> Okay, sorry, Scott. <laughs> Go no, that's it. That's it. Now that's a great Christmas idea, or whatever holiday you happen to celebrate. Oh, absolutely, um, and also, of course, you guys are available as consultants if you want to do something at a at a more substantive transformational scale. Um, Paul. Yeah, well, I'm just a LinkedIn guy, so please you'll find me there, and uh, you can contact me through LinkedIn. Great, great. Okay. Wow. Well, so just some thoughts to me um, that I really took away from the book and from this session. So thank you so much for joining. Um, I think the first thing that really strikes me is how doable and accessible this is. You know, I think we often think of, as I said, we think of innovation as this thing that's the purview of lone geniuses and people, you know, in turtlenecks at midnight coming up with inspirational lightning fast ideas and what you're really showing is it's what maybe Linda Hill calls collective genius you know the ability to get 27,000 people uh, on board and so I really appreciate your decoding that and showing how it works and, uh, and and making it really possible for people to take maybe one step along that journey so thank you so much for spending an hour and I'm looking forward to actually getting my copy of the book when it comes <laughs> so thank you <laughs>